We are expecting an attack at any moment. We try and make ourselves as comfortable as possible. But the more we dig, the more bodies we find. We just leave one graveyard for another. It's enough to drive one mad. To enter the trenches of the Western Front was to enter another world. What happened on these battlefields gave a new and terrible meaning to the notion of sacrifice. A kind of sacrifice defined by a single word. Slaughter. As 1916 began, the Allies could only hope for better times. On the Western Front, the German army was still firmly entrenched on French and Belgian soil. On the Eastern Front, the Russian army was suffering massive losses. Across the ocean, the United States was still at peace. industry was booming. Charlie Chaplin was delighting audiences around the world. And Albert Einstein announced his general theory of relativity. But it was the war that remained on everyone's mind. There was food rationing in Germany. Submarine warfare on the high seas. Air raids on allied cities. No one, it seemed, was safe. In the trenches, the killing went on. Most soldiers were horrified by what they encountered at the front. Not Otto Dix, a young German artist turned machine gunner. He marched off to war with two books. One was the Bible, the writings of the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. When you look into the abyss, Nietzsche wrote, the abyss also looks into you. I had to go to war. I had to live through it. I had to see it all with my own eyes. The hunger, the fleas, the mud, the shitting in one's pants with fear. To be crucified. To experience the deepest abyss of life. It's for that reason I went to war. Like many artists, Dix loved to shock. Even before the war, he had been attracted to grotesque images. But what Dix found on the battlefield was beyond his worst imaginings. He'd actually had three years nearly at the front as a gunner in very heavy firing consistently in France, Flanders and Russia. But we know from other people's statements that this bloke would sit in the trench just before and after grenades were biffing around the place and actually make drawings. Only after the war did Dix realize that he had been changed in a profound way. It was then that Dix created these images. He painted them, he said to rid himself of the war and years of constant nightmares. You can almost smell the putrid flesh through his paint. They show the horrendous physical conditions of the trenches. They show blokes eating 
supper in a trench, leaning against the dead body of one mate and the skeleton of another, embedded literally into the wall of the trench, munching at his supper as though nothing was happening. You could say he was painting it out of his system, painting it not just to forget, but also painting it because he wanted people to know what the effects of war were like. What is war in the 20th century? Few people knew better than Otto Dix. Lice, rats, barbed wire, fleas, shells, bombs, underground caves, corpses, blood, liquor, mice, cats, artillery, filth, bullets, mortars, fire, steel. That is what war is. It's all the work of the devil. By 1916, people everywhere were asking what it would take to end the war. A new and murderous answer came from the commander of the German army, Erich von Falkenhayn. Germany, he believed, was running out of time. A decisive victory required striking at the heart of the Western Front. That meant France. Falkenhayn's battle plan called for attacking Verdun, a city protected by a group of underground fortresses and a place so important to French pride that they would pay any price to defend it. Battle of Verdun is the Battle of France. It's the place of the identity of France. Uh, there was no battle before, no battle after, which was so important uh, for in, in the French memory. So you can't understand France without understanding Verdun. Verdun had been the site of legendary battles dating back to the Roman Empire. Outcomes of entire wars were decided here. The loss of Verdun would be a devastating blow to the French. Falkenhayn knew it. Three French soldiers, he predicted, would die for every German. This was the strategy of attrition. The aim was not to gain territory, but to bleed the enemy to death. Now that battle of attrition was unique in history because its initial purpose was not to win it, but to create a kind of stalemate in which the other side would be worn down so severely that they would be unable to attack or maybe even to prosecute the war at all. It's a form of attrition to yield a victory after a mountain of corpses was produced. It's a new kind of war. Falkenhayn's code name for the battle was Gericht, the place of judgment. On February 21st, 1916, the German army began a massive bombardment by 1,200 guns. Never before had so much artillery been assembled over such a narrow front. The French command was taken by surprise. Just as Falkenhayn believed, they rushed troops to the front. We are lost, one soldier wrote in his diary. 
They have thrown us into the furnace. Verdun, when you got there, you were in the crucible. There was no way out. Soldiers could see it for miles, glowing in the distance because of the artillery bombardment. Fort Duermont, a stronghold in the French line, was defended by only a handful of soldiers. It was captured by the Germans without firing a shot. The retaking of the fort, one French general later estimated, cost France 100,000 men. French soldiers entering Verdun believed they had been handed their death sentence. One of them was 38-year-old attorney turned Lieutenant Henri Designon. At every moment we are sprayed with clouds of earth and stone splinters. How many men are afraid? How many men are weak at the knees? We are no longer in a civilized world. One suffers and says nothing. Designo spent only two weeks at Verdun, but he called his time there a glimpse of hell, a place where men struggled not only to stay alive, but to keep their sanity. There's death everywhere. At our feet, the wounded groan in a pool of blood. For hours, these groans and supplications continue until they die before our eyes without anyone being able to help them. The French paid dearly for defending, but so did the German army. To the surprise of Falkenhayn, the battle took on a life of its own. His strategy of attrition turned into a bloodbath for both sides. The element of surprise was gone. So too were the woods that once had hidden the German army from view. Only the underground fort seemed to offer protection. But as German soldier William Hermans discovered, they too were caverns of terror. It was an enormous place, crowded with many hundreds of soldiers. Some lay on bunks sleeping, snoring, and moaning. Here a flashlight, there a candle, match, or cigarette dotted the dark with flickering islands of light, continually shifting in brightness. I opened my knapsack to get something to eat, but a putrid smell spoiled what little appetite I had. Schulze told me that under this heap of earth, many French soldiers were buried, having been killed by poison gas when we Germans captured this underground stronghold. Suddenly, I heard the cry, poison gas. I saw people around me putting on their gas masks.
so many were dying and the bunks and floors were filled with bodies over which the living stepped and stumbled in search of air. of the dead Frenchmen who were gassed and lay under the very mount on which I was standing had demanded and were receiving their revenge. Fimrich said to me, Remember, Veli, we must not hate the French for using gas. We used it first. After Verdun, the burden of the Allied effort on the Western Front shifted to the British and the civilian army they sent to war. Goodbye, Nelly. I'm going across the main. Farewell, Nelly. This parting gives me pain. I shall always love you, as true as the stars above. I'm going to do my duty for the girl I love. Recruitment in Britain came in waves. In 1914, one million men came forward as volunteers. In 1915, another million followed. They made a promise very early on that if you joined up in a group, uh, the group would be kept together. And the phrase was, join up with your pals, or your chums, your friends. And so uh, you got what was to prove, I mean, was potentially this tragic situation, ghastly situation, of whole streets of young men going off together, whole sort of little factories of young men going off together. It was ghastly because they were all going to get killed together. At first, there were not enough uniforms or weapons. Some pals trained with wooden rifles and were happy to have them. Even advanced training for officers could be comical, as the poet turned second lieutenant Siegfried Sassoon recorded. Sometimes a renowned big game hunter gave us demonstrations of the art of sniping. He was genial and enthusiastic, but I was no good at rifle shooting. A gas expert from GH would inform us that gas was still in its infancy. Most of us were either dead or disabled before gas had had time to grow up. But the star turn in the classroom was a massive sandy-haired Highland major whose subject was the spirit of the bayonet. He spoke with homicidal eloquence. Man, it seemed, had been created to jab the life out of the Germans. To hear the major talk, I might have thought he did it himself every day after breakfast. Not everyone was excited to go to war. Edward Thomas was among the reluctant. His wife Helen watched him struggle to reach a decision. He hated the newspaper patriotism. He saw through the lies and deception of the press as he'd always seen through untruths. Still for Thomas, there was a sense of obligation which eventually won out. Helen Thomas spent a final night with her husband, not knowing if she would ever see him again. I sit and stare stupidly at his luggage by the wall. He takes out his compass and explains it to me, but I cannot see. And when a tear drops onto it, he just shuts it up and puts it away. Then he takes a book out of his pocket. You see, your Shakespeare sonnets are already where they will always be. Shall I read you some? He reads one or two to me. His face is grey and his mouth trembles, but his voice is quiet and steady. And soon I slip to the floor and sit between his knees. And while he reads, his hand falls over my shoulder and I hold it with mine. 
shall I undress you by this lovely fire and carry you upstairs? So he undoes my things, and I slip out of them. So we lay, all night, sometimes talking of our love and all that had been, and of the children and what had been amiss, and what right. We knew the best was that there had never been untruth between us. We knew all of each other, and it was right. So talking, and crying, and loving in each other's arms, we fell asleep as the cold, reflected light of the snow crept through the frost-covered windows. Edward Thomas could have stayed in England as a training officer, but requested frontline duty. In April 1917, he was killed by an artillery shell. In 1916, Britain's volunteer army fought its first major battle. It happened here, in the fields around the Somme River. One hundred and twenty-five miles northwest of Verdun, the British and French armies met at the Somme. Here, the Allies hoped to break through the German lines with a joint attack along a thirty-mile front. The commander of the British Army, Douglas Haig, is forever linked to this battle. Few generals in history have been so fiercely defended or harshly criticized. Haig was not the dunderhead that he, and certainly he was not the intentional butcher that he's often portrayed as being. Haig, in fact, remained an imaginative commander who always believed that he could bring off great, sweeping, decisive victories. And this is where he failed, because in this war, you are never going to bring off great, sweeping, decisive victories. And if you tried, you were going to get your men killed. Haig was committed to pushing the German army out of France. But he had a problem. His army of civilian volunteers were patriotic and brave, but they were not battle-tested. There were limits, he believed, to what they could do. Yet the French were urging an attack. If pressure was not taken off or done, France might collapse. Haig agreed to launch a major offensive. The battle plan called for a massive bombardment of German positions for seven days. The German lines were to be pulverized then waves of Allied soldiers would simply walk across no man's land and capture the enemy's trenches. You will not need rifles, some of the men were told. You will find the Germans all dead. Not even a rat will have survived. The commanders on both sides of the Western Front believed at the beginning of 1916 that they had found the answer to stalemate and the high explosive shell. 
they were mesmerized by the huge accumulation of shells that had now come into them. They said this was bigger than anything that had ever been seen in warfare. Rumor says we are to smash the Hun line altogether, shove in our army, and finish the war. Rumor also says that we have given Germany four days to declare peace or take the consequences. Twenty-six-year-old Kenneth Callan McArdle was among the optimists. The eldest son of an Irish brewer, he had been ranching in California before the war. After spending a winter in the trenches on the Somme, he was spoiling for a fight. I am not addicted to boasting, but I think if he could see all the guns behind, all the grenades, trench mortars, stores in front, if he knew how thoroughly ready we are, and if he could conceive how we are longing for the day, I think if he knew, the Kaiser would cut his losses and take poison. barrage that had ever been, so they were firing over a hundred thousand shells a day. And that, of course, gave the soldiers great confidence, because they thought, how can anybody live under this bombardment? Stefan Westman a doctor with the German army, arrived at the front just as the bombardment began. For seven days and seven nights, the ground shook under the constant impacts of light and heavy shells. Our dugouts crumbled, and our positions were raised to the ground. No food or water reached us. Down below, men became hysterical. Even the rats panicked. The bombardment prepared the ground and was supposed to clear the ground of fighting soldiers. It never really achieved this aim. The more heavy the shelling, the deeper the dugouts became. And it was certainly a nightmare to have to survive. But soldiers did survive. At 7.26, on the morning of July 1st, 1916, the British detonated a massive bomb underneath the German line. There followed a moment of silence. These very few seconds of silence set in, and this was the signal. Everyone uh, on the German side knew this was the beginning of the rising of the, sol of the Allied soldiers from the trenches and the attack. The British got up out of their trenches, shoulder to shoulder for about 10 or 15 miles, and proceeded to advance across no man's land. And uh, as they did so, the Germans, who of course had been waiting in terror in their trenches, realized when they heard the bombardment stop that the attack was coming. They rushed up from their dugouts beneath the trenches and set up their machine guns and began to fire for their lives, literally for their lives, because, of course, it was, it was kill or be killed. It was a kind of relief to be able to come out, even into air still filled with smoke and the smell of cordite. They started firing furiously, and the British had frightful losses. By now, Lieutenant Callan McArdle was in the middle of no man's land, a place where no soldier had stood in daylight for two years. As we advanced, German shells littered the battlefield with dead and wounded. All around us and in front, men dropped or staggered about. I found a sergeant and shouting asked where were his officers. 
All gone, sir, he shouted back. The attack was a disaster. Sunset brought merciful relief from the blazing July sun. In darkness, thousands of wounded soldiers began crawling to their trenches. The ones who made it back were taken to hospitals behind the lines. The operating rooms were ablaze. The place by one o'clock in the morning was a shambles. The air was thick with steaming sweat. Mary Borden was a well American who had been traveling in France when the war broke out. Rather than return home, she volunteered to run a field hospital. It was my business to sort out the wounded as they were brought in from the ambulances and to keep them from dying before they got to the operating rooms. If I made a mistake, some would die on their stretchers on the floor under my eyes who need not have died. It was all, you see, a dream. The dying men on the floor were drowned men cast up on the beach, and there was the ebb of life pouring over them, sucking them away like an invisible tide. There are chests with holes as big as your fist, and stumps where legs were fastened. There are eyes, blind eyes, and parts of faces, the nose gone, or the jaw. There are these things, but no men. I thought, this is the second battlefield. The battle now is going on over the helpless bodies of these men. It is we who are doing the fighting now, with their real enemies. July 1st, 1916, remains the single worst day in British military history. Twenty thousand British soldiers were dead. Forty thousand were wounded. Entire battalions of pals had died in formation. The first news of the battle to reach Britain would be encouraging. Newspaper headlines reported, great day on the Somme, and new armies make good. But censored newspapers gave readers little understanding of a battle that would last four months. The world's first war documentary changed that. The Battle of the Somme is without doubt the most important film in the social history of the British cinema. It was a great test of how realistic an image of the war the British public could best see exposed in public. Cinema goers were riveted by these images of war. The film was produced by the British government as a morale booster. But audiences often had other unintended responses. At the height of emotion, when the soldiers go over the top, the cinema orchestra stopped playing. So suddenly in the cinema there was silence. Suddenly you were presented with an empty space and images of British soldiers being killed. You were invited to fill that space with your own emotion. There are numerous accounts of, on one occasion, 
a wounded soldier having to be led crying from the, the film, of a woman's voice shouting out in the silence of the cinema, my God, they're dead. The film was seen throughout Britain by millions of people. The British government, like governments everywhere, quickly realized the power of the moving image. Never again in wartime would an official portrayal of battle be so naive or so real. The film's run ended in the fall of 1916, but on the fields of the Somme, the battle continued, claiming hundreds, sometimes thousands of lives each day. Again and again, the British attacked. The Germans counterattacked. For both sides, it was slaughter. What was it that made the Battle of the Somme last as long as it did? And what was the purpose of it? It's probably true to say that the men who fought it had never seen anything like it before. The generals who planned it had no precedent. The other side of looking at it is more critical. This was not supposed to be a nutrition battle, a battle to wear the other side down. It was stated as a breakthrough battle. But the longer the battle went on, the more evident it was that no breakthrough was possible. And yet, the battle continued. In some ways, it led to a redoubling of efforts. It didn't lead away from the war. It led to its deeper, more profound, more vicious prosecution. The regiment was crumbling away. All the world was forever dead to Vaudry and Camworthy, to Chesham, Sprout, Ford, and of the other ranks. We did not know how many. Vaudrey used to enjoy early morning parades. Chesham had loved to hunt the buck in Africa when the heat was shimmering with the birth of the day. Young Victor was killed. His problem of marriage to a woman six years his senior finally settled. General Shea has wired, well done, 90th Brigade. You will attack again soon. We are about 400 strong today. We who went in, 800. This was McArdle's last diary entry. Within days, he too was dead. Only in November, when the weather turned bad, did Haig call off the battle. The Allied army had advanced exactly six miles. Four miles short of the objective, Haig's cavalry had hoped to take on the opening day. Just like Verdun, the Battle of the Somme resulted in one million casualties. And the battle lines hardly changed at all. Siegfried Sassoon fought on the Somme. His actions there left him with a bullet in the shoulder, the military cross for bravery, and a growing doubt about the war. I looked across at Albert. Its tall trees were flat, grey-blue outlines, and the broken tower of the basilica might have been a gigantic clump of foliage. Only the distant thud of gunfire disturbed the silence, like someone kicking footballs or thumping miles away. Low in the west, Pale orange beams were streaming down on the country that receded with a sort of rich, regretful beauty, like the background of a painted masterpiece. For me, that evening expressed the indeterminate tragedy which was moving with agony on agony toward the autumn. I leant on a wooden bridge, gazing down into the green glooms of the weedy little river. But my thoughts were powerless against unhappiness so huge. I couldn't alter European history, or order the artillery to stop firing. I could stare at the war as I stared at the sun.
sky, longing for life and freedom, and vaguely altruistic about my fellow victims. But a second lieutenant could attempt nothing, except to satisfy his superior officers. And altogether, I concluded, Armageddon was too immense for my solitary understanding. Like most of the infantry, I'd expected too much of the Battle of the Somme. When this blasted war is over, no more soldiering for me. When I get my civvy clothes on, Oh, how happy I shall be. I shall sound my own revalley. I shall make my own tattoo. No more NCOs to curse me. No more bloody army stew. Not every day in the trenches on the Western Front was like the cauldron of Verdun or the first day of the Battle of the Somme. In some sections of the line, there were unofficial live-and-let-live live truces between opposing forces. Behind the lines and in training camps, an entire social arose among men determined to forget the worst of trench warfare. Cavalry regiments organized jumping competitions. The infantry formed football leagues and held boxing tournaments. The Canadians, and later the Americans, played baseball. They wrote and published their own irreverent newspapers, and they watched films. Charlie Chaplin was everyone's favorite. They also formed dramatic troops with names like the Duds and the Shrapnels. Lacking women in the vaudeville shows, they created their own. Sometimes convincingly so. We might have lost the war, one British officer told the journalist Philip Gibbs, if it had not been for laughter. 500 men were there packed tight, and all with their eyes fixed with fascination upon a little lighted stage where there was a world of comedy and song, which witched those men's souls away from the war zone. A topping show, said an officer. It brightens up the men to no end. Diversions played a vital role on each side of the trenches for surviving required more than avoiding bullets and shells. It required the creation of these special worlds, a way of recapturing human dignity in spite of the worst the war could offer. And some argue the worst the war could offer was a battle in 1917 called Passchendaele. From Ypres, I long to be where German snipers can't snipe at me. Damp is my dugout, cold are my feet, waiting for whiz bangs to send me to sleep. A year had passed since the first day of the Battle of the Somme. And again, British General Douglas Haig was convinced the German army might succumb with one more onslaught. 
The attack this time would come in Belgium. Haig's plan called for crossing the German lines, overlooking the town of Ypres. Then the British army would sweep across the low plains and swing north to the sea. This time, there seemed reason for optimism. Weapons like tanks, aircraft, light machine guns, and trench mortars were now to be used in a coordinated battle plan. The use of these tactics showed promise when British and Canadian forces advanced three and a half miles during the Battle of Arras. This was the largest gain of territory since the beginning of trench warfare. The British Army's next move was also encouraging. After two years of tunneling beneath the Belgian countryside, Allied soldiers set off a series of 19 giant mines under the German lines at Messines Ridge. They go off simultaneously and they completely disrupt and disorder the German line. This is a major Allied victory. What happens? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. The positions are occupied and the Allies stop. The British Army doesn't attempt to link this major victory with movements in other parts of the front. Instead, they take six weeks the problem of command, who's going to run it, with what destinations, and to move their artillery further north to hit the other two major centers of German resistance. King George V was treated to a tour of the battlefield. Six weeks passed before the offensive resumed, just in time for the onset of the wettest summer and autumn in years. Airplanes could not fly, tanks could not move, and soldiers, with their hopes for victory, drowned in mud. In spite of the weather, Haig and his commanders ordered repeated attacks across what were now swamps. Whatever lessons had been learned since the Somme were ignored in this battle known as Passchendaele. Men caught in the mud could be found a day or two later, lower down, and with their minds gone. Horses would go. Whole carts would go. Drowning in mud is, in many respects, the signature of Passchendaele. Mud and rain and wretchedness and blood. Why should jolly soldier boys complain? God made these before the roofless flood. Mud and rain. Mangling crumps and bullets through the brain. Jesus never guessed them when he died. Jesus had a purpose for his pain. I, like abject beasts, we shed our blood, often asking if we die in vain. Gloom conceals us in a soaking sack, mud and rain. It is only murder, attempting to advance over such ground, one British soldier complained. Paul Nash was outraged by what he saw too. He was sent to the front, not as a soldier, but as an official war artist. Sunset and sunrise are blasphemous. They are mockeries to man. Only the black rain out of the bruised and swollen clouds all through the bitter black of night is fit atmosphere in such a land. The rain drives on. mud becomes more evil yellow. The shell holes fill up with green white water. The roads and tracks are covered in inches of slime. The 
black dying trees ooze and sweat and the shells never cease. I don't understand the battle myself. Maybe nobody does. Nor did the people who fought it. It's a symbol of futility, maybe even an icon of futility. Uh, but it's, it's remembered with much more bitterness than the Battle of the Somme. It's as if the Somme was a, a tragedy and a Passchendaele was a crime. Three months passed before Haig called off the campaign. Instead of a breakthrough, his army had advanced only five miles further into a swamp. Total casualties for both sides, over half a million men killed, wounded, or missing. By now, soldiers everywhere were beginning to question why they were fighting at all. Out here, men have been thinking. The most insistent question is, why am I here? The greatest wrong is, I am still here. But an end will come. And the next day will be a day of reckoning. Everyone knows that out here. Do they know it at home? I wonder, they will.